Well, the subject says, how do we solve Bangalore's traffic problem as though I have a solution? <laughs> but trust me, I do not have one fully. Um, the, the title is very promising and something that we all should work towards together too. Um, thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity to come here and uh, speak a few words, share a few thoughts about this very important uh, problem statement that all of us as Bengalurians, as residents of this great city that we confront every single day. This is also particularly a subject that over the last four and a half years, working as your member of parliament, I have got to grapple with every day, have tried to understand it better, have tried to uh, understand it from both the perspective of a citizen also as a public representative, also having got an opportunity to understand how decisions are made, how policy is being made uh, with respect to urban mobility in the city. Over the last four and a half years, I have more than anything else been a keen student of understanding urban mobility and trying to understand what solutions actually work better. And this is all that I want to share with all of you today. Not as an expert, not as a, uh, somebody who knows it all about this, but as somebody who has tried to understand over the last four and a half years how decision is made with respect to public policy, how um, outcomes are uh, measured, and some unique personal experiences that I would want to share. This is the context. Well, just... Uh, a few days ago, we all read in the newspapers of a new distinction that our city achieved. And uh, this is not something, uh, something particularly that we can be proud of. Um, we emerged overtaking Delhi as the city with the largest number of private vehicles in the country. So, in another program, while I shared this uh, statistic, there was immediately a huge round of applause. <laughs> and uh, naturally, because the uh, fact that a large number of Bengalurians are able to afford and buy private vehicles is a very clear marker of a robust economy in Bengaluru. And no wonder that we are also the city that has the highest per capita income among all cities in India. But it is also a reflection of our very poor and inadequate public transport system. So, as somebody who is concerned about the city's sustainable growth, as people who, are, who have to be concerned about how Bengaluru should look like, how Bengaluru should be, say, 25 years, 50 years from now, this is particularly a very worrying statistic that the city's population is forced to, I would say, rely on private transport because we have not, as a state, as governments, as the corporation, not worked enough to make public transport accessible, affordable, and convenient. So this is, this is the challenge that all of us are now grappling to, are now trying to solve. Now, I don't want to bore you all with a lot of numbers. This is something that all of you know. But I would still want to take your attention to just one particular statistic here. From 1990 to now, there has been a 6,000% increase in number of vehicles in Bengaluru. 6,000% increase. And the road size and the road carrying capacity is pretty much what was in 1990 or just a gradual or incremental increase. So, why Bangalore is having traffic jams is not a, a, a 
you know, rocket science question. It's very simple. There has been fast paced economic growth. The road carrying capacity has pretty much remained the same. And because public infrastructure, public money has not been spent much on building public transport solutions, people are now forced to buy private vehicles and there is a 6,000 percent increase in private vehicle ownership in the city. And the, all other numbers, the average speed of road in uh, vehicles is just 4 kilometers in outer ring road. The total number of vehicles registered is 2.1 crore. That is almost twice the number of people who are in Bengaluru. So that is, that is symptomatic of the extent of the problem in the city. So this is just to understand how deep the problem is so that we know that band-aids do not work, that we need a surgery to address this. Just look at this. This is 20, 2002 and this is the Belandur and Vartur lakes. You will find the Belandur lake here, you will find the Vartur lake here and this is the Marathali village. Okay, this is just 2002. Look at this map. You will see these green patches, you will see there is so much of uh, clear uh, fields, you will find very less habitation. You will also see the old airport road there. Okay, and now look at this. This is 2019. You will also see how the very nature of the lakes have changed. You will see that the drainage areas and all of that have all been encroached. You will also see that starting from here to wherever you will see up to the white field area, you will see a, a proper concrete jungle if there is, you know, for lack of a better word. So this is something that is very emblematic of the city's growth and city's outburst as a metropolis. This is how Bangalore has been growing. And this is the infamous ORR where you had the traffic jam recently and where every day commute for most of Bengalurians is a challenge. Now you will also see how the built up area and everything has suddenly changed and uh, how there is a lack of planning in the sense of, uh, you know, see this is the natural topography because the natural topography is generally not respected. There is uh, instances of floods, instances of uh, inundation that is so frequently reported. Now, this is something that as a public representative over the last four years, this is a vicious cycle of congestion that I have kind of seen from close. The very few months into office, I thought the solution to most of these problems is creating bigger roads, more flyovers. And that came as a very natural solution from the public themselves. Let me give you an example that many of you can relate to as uh, a South Bengalurian. Uh, if you would have traveled on the uh, Vega city to um, the Hoskere Halli main road, the uh, outer ring road, you will encounter horrifying traffic jams near our Saraki junction, right? So the JP Nagar metro station and Saraki junction. So every other day there is a group of uh, citizens who come to our office and their request is only one thing. Sir, can you widen the road? Can you create a flyover there? So naturally, the very first reaction was to write to the authorities and ask them to make a flyover. Because common sense tells you that the traffic jam is happening because there is more traffic, there is a lot of vehicles on the road, there is less road capacity, therefore increase the carrying capacity. So public is coming to you and asking you for making more roads. So you say, okay, let me make some more roads. So now what is that going to happen? See, you will see this. Public pressure to increase road, road capacity because public thinks that the easiest and the only way to solve traffic is by increasing road capacity. So we do that. New flyover capacity is added, underpasses, flyovers, widening of roads are done. Then what that creates is, it creates for a certain period of time a little convenience for car users before you know it, it immediately starts, uh, you know, uh, getting crammed up again and there is traffic again on that flyover as well and you will see there is traffic jams on that flyover as well. 
and then you will also see that you know uh, uh, that again leads to uh, urban sprawl is favored as people can now travel longer distances with car because the moment you are encouraging people to buy more cars people would want to travel larger distances in the city instead of commuting shorter distances and uh, using public transport so because it is assumed or presumed that it's convenient to travel longer distances using a private vehicle so this is a cycle so there is a traffic jam therefore public asks you to build roads the public representatives and government and other uh, stakeholders increase the carrying capacity thereby you are making it convenient for a very short period of time for car commuters private commuters to use roads before again all of that getting clogged up and because people are using private transport using their private vehicles there is an incentive for long distance of travel and because there is a long distance of travel your land policy usage is not concentrated because people are ready to travel longer distances so this again creates the whole thing where the number of trips and number of vehicle uh, length increases more congestion and more delay so this is a cycle any road you you go to any area in the last four and a half years wherever i have met people across my constituency if there is a traffic jam the solution that the public proposes the solution that many a times the traffic police proposes many times the solutions that the bbmp and you know the authorities propose is always an underpass or an overpass an elevated road or widening of the road and it is a solution for a few months and right after that it gets clogged up there is congestion so what we are doing in essence is we have gotten into a trap where we are continuously encouraging more and more purchase of private vehicles longer travel distances within the city discouraging mixed use land policy we are not thinking of urban planning as a big picture solution where land planning town planning is also a part of the uh, solution and by doing this we are stuck in a quagmire where we are not able to get out of so this is something that is very symbolic of not just bengaluru but most of urban india you you know sometimes i feel that uh, bengaluru has attracted a lot of infamy for its traffic jams uh, uh, singularly but honestly even cities like delhi cities you know i mean i have been stuck in gurgaon for hours together uh, and the traffic situation in gurgaon is pretty much as bad as bangalore is so this problem is not unique to the city of bengaluru it is unique to almost all urban centers across the country because we have not understood what actually solves traffic and urban congestion now this is something that uh, uh, you know we discussed earlier and this is a term that i want all of you to remember the vehicle to citizen ratio now unlike the united states where there is a large land mass and significantly lesser population compared to india which can go the private vehicle route and still maintain some kind of semblance of you know uh, normalcy on the streets a country as populous as india and cities as populous as bengaluru cannot afford to have an unsustainable vehicle to citizen ratio so the natural common sense dictates that efforts must be made to reduce the vehicle to citizen ratio and keep it in a sustainable manner this is again common sensical the area occupied by cars is eight times the area occupied by buses area occupied by and this for two wheelers is five times the area occupied by buses this is something that i want you to read a car is consuming 38 times more space on the road during peak hour to carry one person than a bus and a two wheeler is 4.8 times 
So this is all commonsensical. This is nothing rocket science. You know, everybody knows the you know more number of cars is never going to solve the problem. Now, despite all of these things, which are glaring at us and you know telling us the reality, governments after governments, ministers after ministers keep proposing what I would call tunnel vision solutions. Okay, and you may have seen the the current deputy chief minister has been championing this tunnel roads in Bengaluru as a solution for Bengaluru's congestion problem. And uh, over the last uh, six, seven months, I have been consistently opposing this idea, not because it has come from a political leader from the opposing party, but I have been uh, I have been opposing this primarily on the basis of science, facts, ex lived experience around the world and on models that our own scientists and traffic engineers in the IASC who have come up with these simulated models to understand whether this is a probable solution or not. So look at this. The IASC in Bengaluru conducted a simulated survey to understand if this proposed tunnel road solution will actually help Bengaluru solve its congestion problem. Just two points that I would want all of your attention to. For traffic data from 2023, it will there will be a 2.7% increase in the vehicle kilometer traveled if there is a tunnel road, while there will be a 5.3% reduction with a metro line along the same route. Look at this another one. When we use the estimated data of 2030, the tunnel road increases the vehicle kilometer travel by 4%, while a metro network in the same tunnels will reduce the vehicular traffic by 11.3%. But these are numbers, these are figures, these are uh, uh, models that are hardly discussed when decisions are made by public representatives and governments. Because if these were things that had to be relied on as a decision making tool, then we wouldn't be mindlessly going on uh, this clamor for building more highways, more, uh, more uh, building more uh, elevated highways in the city. I mean, building highways from one city to another is a very different matter altogether. But Inside of the city, these tunnel roads, expanding of roads, widening of roads, tunnel roads, underpasses, this mindless clamor will stop if we start understanding these numbers and if these numbers serve as the edifice on which policies are made. Now just compare the metro rail systems of Bengaluru with two other met, uh, important cities which have almost similar population size. Bengaluru has 1 crore 31 lakh population and we have you know 7.1 uh, uh, daily ridership in metro that has now increased after the purple line has completely you know uh, started functioning which is again an indication that if you allow for convenient completed metro projects the public laps it up and starts using it immediately it's a validation that public transport works now paris has 41 lakh Th London has 36 lakh and we are still at 17, 7.1 and now it is around 10 lakhs per day. So we have the network length of 73 whereas Paris has 227 and London has 403. Now this is the proposed network of Bengaluru Metro that is at various stages of implementation. And when this, the whole of this will be complete, then Bengaluru will have about 317 kilometer of metro connectivity in the city. This is what that we must be working on and putting all our energies towards. But unfortunately, in the last four years, my experience of working with BMRCL has not been satisfactory. And as Bengalurians, you will also perhaps share the same sentiment that most of the deadlines that the BMRCL announces 
is never met and there is inordinate delays there is inordinate cost overruns and i don't think there is a single deadline that bmrcl has met which it ha which has uh, which which the deadline which was announced by itself now what has what are some of the why are these challenges why is this uh, inordinate delay well there are some structural issues itself in the bmrcl as an organization you may have uh, been following my uh, social media from some, quite some time from at least the last 8 months bmrcl did not have a full time managing director and the bmrcl is currently handling more than 1 lakh crore worth of projects in bengaluru can you imagine an organization of that scale so vital to the city's infrastructure being headless for almost a year so why is the, and and what also surprises me is there is no public demand there is no public apathy and in fact i would say there is very limited awareness among the public of the consequences of not having a full time md for such a large project because let me tell you irrespective of the party political leaders are very sensitive to public pressure so when there is public pressure political leaders and governments will immediately respond but unfortunately there is no demand for even a, even after a long spate of almost almost a year when there was no member of when there was no managing director for a large important vital institution for the city as bmrcl we didn't see the public coming and demanding that from the pub, from the government because we still don't understand that metro is the solution for our congestion problems we do not yet understand why we need dynamic leadership for such kind of organizations now if this is the first problem the second problem in an organization like bmrcl why is delhi metro a very successful project because right from its inception delhi metro had technocrats as its leaders whereas bengaluru metro has always had an ias officer as its managing director whether it was e shridharan or his successors most of the leaders of delhi metro were technocrats and here we have ias officers i have nothing uh, uh, you know but respect for most of them but just the fact that you know we have somebody who is managing kannada and culture department today suddenly becomes a uh, you know uh, uh, managing director of metro the next day and uh, their tenure is complete and the very next day you will have somebody who was managing food and civil supplies who comes and you know uh, starts uh, managing the metro for the city then that is not the very best solution so i personally feel that organizations like the metro organizations like the k ride which is the nodal agency for implementing the suburban rail project these institutions must actually have a technocrat to lead it but in the last four and a half years and when i say four and a half years i am politically agnostic i am making this as a policy suggestion that irrespective of governments which have come in the state the leadership of metro has always been led by a generalist ias than a specialist technocrat third and this is something that will again uh, uh, you know shock you or surprise you 90% of the staff of bmrcl are contract based staff you don't have full time staff and at least the main senior roles are all manned by people who were earlier working in a different organization have now retired and have now joined this as a post retirement opportunity so most of them are 68 70 very senior officers very senior people who had work for 58 60 years in another department and have come here as a post retirement opportunity in a press conference at a point in time when i was very upset i i even called bmrcl as a vruddhashrama you know but the point is that the larger point is 
that we are not giving the kind of importance, the political capital, that the most important organization that can actually solve Bengaluru's traffic problems needs. That's the only problem. Now, you are seeing that there is already a proposed uh, metro network for 317 kilometers. This proposition has been made from quite some time. Okay? And now we are uh, trying to get uh, different uh, uh, the projects. Uh, uh, these proposals are at different levels of uh, uh, implementation. Some are at uh, pre-DPR, some are true DPR, some have been submitted to the union government, some are here at the state government. So they are at various levels. Now in the middle of all of this, suddenly out of nowhere, absolutely whimsically, the government announces that now we want to extend metro to Birdi, Kanakpura, Hoskote. Okay, now why? Why would the government want to extend the metro to Kanakpura, which is almost a hundred kilometers from the center of the city? Why would they want to take it to Hoskote? when the very name metro suggests that it is a solution for decongesting congesting the core of an urban metropolitan, met, metropolitan area. Why do you want to take it to the suburbs? Because the decision to extend it is not being made on economic, social or even city's futuristic growth decision uh, uh, factors. It is being driven purely by political considerations. Because the minister who gets, a, who, who gets an opportunity to have a call on this, perhaps hails from Kanakpura. So, if we keep making decisions on the basis of such whimsicalities, then how would we be justifying every public rupee spent on these projects. So that is another aspect that we need to keep in mind. And I would request you as citizens, whenever such proposals are made, and if it on the very face of it seems ludicrous, please voice out your public opinion, because trust me when I say this, all political leaders, irrespective of their political parties' affiliations, are sensitive to public pressure. So we need to be playing the part as an active vocal citizenry. This is another important slide that I want you to look at. While I spent so much of my time speaking about the metro, is metro the largest public carrier in Bengaluru? No. What is? It's the BMTC. And I was surprised that, and this will surprise and shock all of you as well, in almost close to a decade, the fleet size of BMTC has almost remained near stagnant. Let me repeat this again for the shock value. In almost close to a decade, the fleet size of BMTC, which is the largest public carrier in Bengaluru, has remained near stagnant. You will notice that in Bengaluru, the fleet size is somewhere around 6,500. In Paris, it is 9,500. London, it is 9,300. So, and you will also see that while our fleet size is less, the network length that it is covering is higher which means that last mile connectivity, last mile uh, uh, you know, reach, which is so critical for usage of public transport is not being effectively met. So now what is the best solution for this? I will, you know, uh, the best solution is an integrated system of metro and buses where buses will play a very important role in last mile connectivity and metro will be the preferred mode of choice for long distance travel. 
this is the only solution that all cities in India must canvas for and must work towards implementing. Now, uh, I want to also, uh, you know, use this opportunity to reflect on another aspect that I have been thinking about and had written to the Chief Minister a couple of times. Why should there be a monopoly of the BMTC in running buses in Bengaluru? Why don't we open up at least certain routes, at least certain high density corridors for private players? Because if the government is not adding buses to increase the fleet size of BMTC, why should private capital not come in and help that happen? But each time I have proposed this, this has always put me in trouble because the words privatization, private capital is still looked through conspiracy lenses in this country. I am definitely not advocating privatization of BMTC. All I am saying is, at least in the high density corridors, where there is definitely a scope for more addition of buses, more different sizes of buses, more innovation, more efficiency, why can't we allow private players also to compete? That is also going to make BMTC more efficient. It is also going to make BMTC you know, be on, the, on its toes and uh, deliver better services. But these again are solutions that are uh, either considered too uh, sensitive politically to touch or sometimes, I mean, and the result is, um, and the, the, the why it is politically uh, sensitive to touch is because there is no organized civil society demand asking for such public transport solutions. So this is again the, re the reason why I'm repeating about the civil society being vocal is because it is very important for at least certain political uh, uh, representatives to advance and canvas a solution if they know that there is a constituency that is actually supporting their cause. Otherwise, uh, many political leaders who would actually want to propose solutions of this kind would hesitate or shy away from doing it because of very natural and real electoral consequences, which is why we need to have a very vocal and participative civil citizenry, which will drive these policy solutions. Now, over the last four and a half years, after all of you elected me to be a member of parliament, there have been some really big high ticket public transport solutions that the Narendra Modi government has sanctioned to Bengaluru. I would want to enumerate a few and say how all of this comes together to help decongest Bengaluru. First, in 2014, the total length of metro connectivity in Bengaluru was only 7 kilometers. And today, the total connectivity of Bengaluru's metro connectivity is 73 kilometers. So in last nine years, the metro connectivity has increased almost 10 times. We were at near about, you know, seven to 10 kilometers. We now are around 73 kilometers. And once the uh, yellow line uh, also gets, uh, you know, sanctioned, we may touch close to 100 kilometers. So that is something that is a very big uh, convenience for the city. The second big thing that we got done again in record time was the satellite township ring road project. Now, what is this? All of you as citizens of Bengaluru will understand that there are multiple highways that enter and exit the city at various points around the city. You have Hosur from here, you have 
the Ballari road that connects, you know, Andhra and uh, uh, Devanhalli and Chikbalapura. You have Mysore from one side. You have Tumkur Highway on the other side. Close to 40% of vehicular traffic, especially heavy vehicular traffic inside of the city is transit traffic, which is trying to come from one part of the outside of the city and trying to get outside of the city to another place. Almost 30 to 40 percent of the traffic. The reason why they had to get through the city was because there is no ring road that bypasses the city and enables them to go outside. So what we did was in 2019 a proposal was given to the Ministry of Highways to come up with a satellite township ring road project which will bypass all these all the whole city by connecting the entry and exit points in a circular manner in just 3 years time a 268 kilometer long strr is now complete and almost 40% of vehicular traffic which will come inside the city uh, which were which was earlier forced to come inside the city will be able to go outside of the city bypassing the whole city once the whole project will be complete which will be done in the next couple of years. Now almost uh, uh, 90 kilometers or so of that project is already complete. So that is another very big important project. The third is the Bengaluru Suburban Rail Project. Now the Bengaluru Suburban Rail Project is older, the proposal is older than me. Okay, That just shows how apathetic and how slow the system was in approving such important projects. Now what was the objective of the suburban rail project? It was to connect the suburbs of the city like the very name suggests. And because the project got delayed by 30 years, what was then suburbs has now become the core part of the city. Which is why now the deputy chief minister wants to take the metro to Kanakpura, really futuristic in a way because you know you have not delivered on suburban so you would now want to take the metro to suburbs because you know that by the time the suburb metro reaches there even Kanakpura will be part of the core of the city. But this project was waiting for approvals from almost 30 years, 30 years. So it was only in 2020 that Prime Minister Modi cleared this project and Bengaluru got its suburban rail project and now K-Ride is an institution that is implementing it. Now I would want to spend another minute on K-Ride, the experience that I have seen over the last four and a half years. K-Ride is again a special purpose vehicle where central government and the state government both have their uh, equity and both have some administrative functions that are distributed. So, Again, K-Ride, since the time of its inception, has not had a technocrat to lead it. And K-Ride, because of the fact that it is a railway project, is a highly technically intensive project. And most of the proposals that K-Ride sends, you may have read in the newspapers, etc., get stuck at the approval levels in the railway ministry and it is again sent back for modifications. So a lot of time is lost in this whole exercise. And historically, whether it is in Karnataka or whether it is outside, the general experience has been that this type of special vehicle, the uh, special purpose vehicle projects with center and state officials working together, they have not functioned very well. And you cannot be having generalists leading technically intensive projects like the railways. I have come to the conclusion at least, have the, my learning at least is that if we want the Bengaluru suburban rail project to become a reality very soon and fructify very quickly, then it must be handed over completely to the railways because they are a technically capable organization who do this day in and day out. And like I said, the current managing director of K-Ride, who is a very senior IAS officer, 
in her previous assignment was heading the Kannada and culture department. Okay, nothing, nothing uh, disrespectful about the office that they are holding, but just that these kind of projects require technical competence. They require because they are highly technically intensive projects. So we need to revisit the way we are, you know, appointing these officers and the guidelines that we lay down while uh, making out the selection criteria. I would want to just uh, conclude with, uh, you know, uh, one last point. This is about lack of integration. Now just, just go through this. We are investing so much of money, public money, literally millions of dollars, building infrastructure like metro, building infrastructure like suburban rail. And the idea is that we need to densify these corridors where these investments are made. But only 17% of jobs in the city are within a walkable distance of the Bengaluru metro. So now, you, most of the times you will know that, okay, you know, you are living in Baswangudi, you are living in Girinagar, you are living in, you know, Jainagar, but you are tr commuting to uh, Outer Ring Road or Marathalli or Whitefield for your job. This is the experience of most of Bengalurians. You go to work in a particular area, you come and live in another area. Right? And you look at this, just 17% of all jobs, office jobs in Bengaluru are around the metro. While we are spending so much money building that. So can't we also look at zoning solutions where there is densification of infrastructure, office infrastructure, residential infrastructure closer to where the metro line passes through. This is also something that we need to uh, you know, think about. And this is again uh, the, uh, you know, the uniformity in road width. I would only want to give you one, one uh, lived experience that all of you will understand. You come out of the airport, there's a six lane highway that welcomes you. You zip uh, at 110, 120, come easily through the city, just come near Hebbal flyover, the six lane suddenly mysteriously disappears and a two lane highway jo completely jam packed welcomes you. Right? So, this is again something that needs to be studied and needs to be addressed. And uh, um, this is another thing that we have been campaigning. I have, uh, I'm really happy that when our earlier government was there in Karnataka, we got this true. There are multiple agencies in Bengaluru that work towards urban transport. There is BMTC, there is Metro, there is KSRTC, there is Railways, there is Traffic Police, then there is BBMP, then there is this organization called DALT. But none of them talk to each other. There is so much of lack of coordination communication. So what was proposed was to introduce a Bengaluru Metropolitan Land Authority Corporation, Land Transport Authority, BMLTA, which will be like the umbrella agency to coordinate all of this. So with a lot of, uh, you know, this idea also came from a lot of civic experts, uh, urban planners. And finally, when our government was there, we pushed it. But unfortunately, in the last eight months, uh, the government of the day has not found time to appoint a chairperson for this body, which is so critical. So even this appointment is pending. Um, so what I will conclude only with this, more roads is definitely not the solution. What we need is last mile connectivity through buses and for all longer distance travel, it's only metro. Mass rapid transport is the only way to solve congestion needs. So as citizens, the thing that we must be demanding is from our governments, from our public policy, pub, uh, from our public representatives is not to widen the roads, not to build more flyovers, not to demand underpasses, but to invest every single rupee on metro and such mass rapid transport solutions. We need to also plan our urban zoning better so that we reduce the travel distance and travel time. We must also think of disincentivizing uh, private uh, vehicular consumption, especially uh, big, large vehicles, these oil guzzlers that uh, really do not make sense. 
at the same time i think a city like bengaluru which is truly futuristic and is a tech capital of the world must also be thinking about solutions like how do we think of integrating say uh, hydrogen energy uh, leveraging that for our public transport solutions how do we make metro more sustainable how do we make our buses more sustainable how do we make the cars that travel in the country in the city more sustainable are there better uh, uh, more sustainable energy solutions that we can think of for making the public transport in the city more uh, efficient so i think in that regard we must be uh, you know uh, thinking i i have been talking to a lot of these uh, uh urban planners traffic engineers from various organizations it's from them that have learned all of these things collated all of this uh, data and numbers from i can only tell you this in conclusion <coughs> political leaders irrespective of parties are sensitive to public opinion i have said this five times already the reason why i say this is because i want all of you to be more active on whatever platforms that you think are needed to get your voice heard effectively and when you see that there are certain political leaders who are actually trying to propose certain sustainable solutions please stand by them in a vocal manner so that they will know that there is a constituency out there that will support them it is very much needed to actually push through these kind of reforms so hoping that there will be a 317 kilometers of metro connectivity within the city very soon and that the fleet size of bengaluru bmtc will increase so that our last mile connectivity will be much easier and affordable and that the city will think of more sustainable energy efficient solutions for powering our city's public transport needs and with the fond hope that there will be a more awakened and a more vocal citizenry that will propose and support these kind of solutions i thank you all for giving me a patient hearing namaste thank you so much i would have uh, in fact love to um have more question answers and some kind of an interaction with all of you but i was just informed that uh, the honorable prime minister is uh, uh, landing about 45 minutes earlier to the scheduled time so i have to be at the airport to receive him on behalf of bengaluru on behalf of all of you so i would request all of you to kindly excuse me uh from uh, this uh, uh, auditorium and from this function today so thank you so much i would look forward to coming again and speaking to all of you um, there are some anecdotal um, uh, experiences that i would have wanted to share in the course of a, a question answer uh, or an interaction round which would um, not only be interesting but also very funny of how uh you know a lot of decisions have been made some really like big ticket decisions were made absolutely whimsically because some politician uh, you know thought acha this is a good decision and some bureaucrat said okay this is also the right thing but absolutely no data on the table absolutely no ex lived experience on the table to relate to i would have loved to you know present some experiences like that in the course of a question answer but uh, i would look forward to doing that some other time um also i would want to specifically thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity because this is not every day that you get to speak about this uh most of if you look at uh, you know when the organizers came to me and uh, gave me this invitation i literally jumped out with joy i told my people whatever we have that day cancel everything we have to go there because this is actually you know because this is actually the job of a political leader a uh, you know um a uh, public representative to be ideating debating talking and discussing about these kind of things but 90% of our time goes away in attending you know weddings in uh, you know some programs uh, house warming ceremonies you know this that but you know that is the nature of the job so when i got the opportunity to come here and uh, share these thoughts with you i was really delighted so thank you so much once again for being such a wonderful audience i look forward to coming again and speaking to you in more detail thank you so much <laughs>